Now we are supposed to have two meetings. The first one is tonight, and then the second one is when? Tomorrow. Have you been informed that the second one is tomorrow? Okay. Okay. So Matthew's Gospel, I want to show you um, where I'm going to be sharing with you from, where I'm taking my subject. Okay. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 6, I want to read to you from verse 9. Well, a large part of what I'm going to be reading is not really it, but um, I want to present to you in a, in a right uh, context. So I'm reading from verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and everybody said amen. amen Jesus used that prayer format to teach his disciples to pray he didn't say pray this prayer he said after this manner therefore pray in other words pray with this format pray this way we've talked about that before but what I want to bring to your notice is his concluding part of his prayer in the 13th verse. It says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I want you to read the rest part of it. I want you to go. Amen. All right, I will just begin the introductory part of our subject tonight. We are studying the kingdom and the power and the glory. All right? Jesus used that terminology. He says, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What is he talking about in his prayer, in the prayer to the Father? He said, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory so the kingdom belongs to God God the Father the power belongs to him and so does the glory for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory what is this kingdom What do you mean the kingdom? Of course, you know we're dealing with the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The more common expression you have from Matthew, the Matthew's gospel, is the kingdom of heaven. He uses that expression more than the other writers. And then mostly with Luke, Mark and Luke, they use the expression, the kingdom of God. Now both expressions are interchangeably used, but um, there's a difference between them, especially when you study the differences where the 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 things that are attributed to the kingdom of heaven are not attributed to the kingdom of God. And that, that, that begins to let you know what the difference might be. Firstly, 
the kingdom of heaven is applied mostly in connection to the Messiah. It is applied mostly in connection to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in his messianic reign. Secondly, the writer always points to the fact that that kingdom is coming. In other words, mostly futuristic. Now remember I said in many areas you will discover they are interchangeably used, but I'll tell you why. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, is mostly applicable to God the Father. And from the study of the word, you discover it seems to have always existed. In other words, the writers show it's in the past, it's in the present, and it's in the future. Now, more accurately distinguished, the kingdom of heaven refers more to the political government of Jesus Christ. It refers more to his political structure and organization. Now, don't think in terms of today's politics, okay? But we're looking at where the Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulder. Amen? So, you're dealing with his structure, his political arrangement. So when it says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's not necessarily thinking in terms of that structure alone but what it represents. For example, in several countries you have political parties that are ruling the nation. It's one country but there's a party that has the political structure. Now, the vision of the kingdom of heaven is to establish the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven works for, for the purpose of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the head of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. So you find Matthew says that Jesus came preaching, announcing that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark, on the other hand, says he came announcing the kingdom of God is at hand. Of course, it's one and the same thing because the kingdom of heaven came to establish the kingdom of God. But you see, until the kingdom of God has taken over, the kingdom of heaven cannot fully establish itself. Are you hearing this? Okay, now just by the way, it's more like uh, the, um, the political party of South Africa many years ago, and they, when they, during the apartheid regime, when they tried to organize themselves, to have a black, not necessarily black, but because the black, uh, uh, even though they had been oppressed, actually had the majority in the population. So they knew they would win the elections if they were allowed a democratic structure. So the political parties were working but they were not, they had no governmental structure. But they were working. 
first they would have to have a federal government there will have to be a government there will have to be a government that will recognize their party before that party could set up a proper structure of government do you understand so now you have the kingdom of heaven Jesus brings in the kingdom of heaven but it is not established in the earth even though it is in the earth it is functioning in the earth but it's not recognized in the earth and the purpose of its work in the earth is to establish the kingdom of God and once the kingdom of God is truly and duly established then the kingdom of heaven takes over which is the kingdom of Jesus Christ and then he reigns and rules and then he delivers everything back to Papa God wonderful hallelujah well let's see how many um, the scriptures here we can we can look at glory to God all right now I want you to look at first um, Corinthians in chapter number 15 from verse 23 but every man in his own order the first fruits Christ the first fruits afterward they that are Christ that he's coming then come at the end you see he's talking about when the when the the, the resurrection takes place when the rapture takes place you know and then he says then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the father which is when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power see that so the day will come when Jesus will deliver the kingdom to Papa God but well how did he get it Papa God gave it to him amen turn to the book of Daniel you are looking at chapter number 7 from verse 21 chapter number 7 book of Daniel I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them when is that going to be that's going to be during the, the great persecution during the, the tribulation period I beheld and the, the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came hallelujah to Jesus you know the time's going to go on as they are now with political structures in the world getting worse and the world having more problems until the Antichrist shows up but of course we believe the rapture will take place at about close to that time and then the Antichrist shows up takes charge in most parts of the world and um, you know end up with the persecution of the part of the church that will be here and persecution of the Jews and then Jesus shows up from heaven so at his second advent is when his political structure takes place you see that and all this time what's been going on is the kingdom of heaven by Jesus Christ and his kids praise God we are establishing the kingdom of God and so here's what happens verse 21 and I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom hallelujah the saints possess the kingdom go straight to verse verse 26 but the judgment shall cease and they shall take away well, well I want you to notice they shall take away his dominion whose dominion will be taken away the little horn that's the antichrist to consume and to destroy it unto the end and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high 
whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hallelujah. So Jesus gets the kingdom established. His political structure finally takes over. And then he reigns and rules. And finally, at the end, delivers it to God the Father. But you know, why are we going to study, or rather, why are we going into the study of the subject? Because we need to know our roles. We need to know our roles. We need to know how to get ourselves prepared. Each one of us actually has a responsibility. First in seeing to the expansion of the kingdom of God. Because we belong in that kingdom. And many of us are functioning in the kingdom of heaven. But you know, like in, in, in every political structure, you've got the good and the bad. The bad guys always find their way in there. But they can't find their way into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, the Bible shows us, as it is right now, because that kingdom, I told you, has not been firmly established on the earth. But it is here in the earth. It is working to establish the kingdom of God. But why that work is going on? There are those who are planted inside to frustrate the work of the kingdom of heaven. St. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 13. I'm reading from verse 24. Are you there? Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man, the kingdom of heaven. Did you notice that expression? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and stood tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, is not thou so good seed in thy field? From whence then had it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Without then that we go and gather them up. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Was it like in these two? The kingdom of heaven. Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the, the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my van. Did you see that? Alright, now, let's go all the way to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. I like what happened here. He says, Jesus sent the multitude away. Which multitude? The multitude of disciples. But then the inner disciples came. They went with him into the house. And he said, tell us the meaning of that parable. The multitude heard it as parables. Now those that are really hungry for spiritual things, come into the house and they say, Master, explain it to us. So they get more knowledge than the rest of those outside. Okay, so where are we? Verse, verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. I told you he is the head of the kingdom of heaven. He that sowed good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. Can you see it now? He says the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's us, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
But the test are the children of the wicked one. Ask the bad guys. It is the other children of the wicked one. Now Jesus means no words. He was very clear as to who was who. Always he said those who didn't have eternal life were the children of the devil. That's what he said. Before a man is born again, he's a child of the devil. He's not just an unconverted. He's not just a known Christian. Jesus says he's a child of the devil. Paul said the, he said the same thing. John said the same thing. He says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. That's what John said. All right, look at it. The enemy that sold them, that sold the bad seed, the test. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, they shall be willing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. He says there are tares among the wheat in the kingdom of heaven that has been sent to establish the kingdom of God. That's the reason why, you know, some people say, oh, how could, uh, how could uh, a pastor backslide? Or how could, uh, uh, how could we have picked somebody who became a cell leader and um, he messed up and even left the church? How could we have that? Well, that's a political arrangement. When you have a cell structure, a PCF structure, a church structure, that's a political arrangement. And he's telling us that an enemy so the tares among the wheat. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, you cannot join the kingdom of God, praise God forevermore. You cannot have tares in the kingdom of God. Why? Because Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You may join his political party, which is the kingdom of heaven, to help establish the kingdom of God, that doesn't mean you are in the kingdom of God. He said you can't see the kingdom of God except you're born again. Why? That kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It is not of this world. But seeks to dominate the world. Seeks to influence the world. Because you see, until the kingdom of God rules this world, man cannot save himself. Man cannot help himself. All the troubles of this world will increase and worsen. No political leader can help this world. When you, when you talk about the kingdom of God, you are dealing with the sovereignty of God. You are dealing with his, with his word, with the powers of that kingdom, influencing and changing the world. But he doesn't want to impose his kingdom on the earth. So Jesus comes in to establish that kingdom through the gospel. And so he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that cast a net into the water. And the water is like the world. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that cast a net into the water. He said, and good and bad fishes all came in. Everybody got in. All kinds of folks got in. And so everybody says, yeah, we are here to preach the gospel. We believe in it. Some believe and some don't. So you ask yourself, do you believe? You see, it's important that you question yourself. Do you believe? 
So it's important to sanctify your believing. What does that mean? It means to examine your faith. Examine your believing. Have you believed the wrong stuff? I'll talk about that in a moment. Sanctify your believing. Some people say, well, I know I believe in Jesus Christ, but um, He is not the only Messiah. That's not believing. The Bible says there is no other name. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. It says there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby you must be saved. As a true Christian, you must believe that scripture. Salvation is by no other. So we, we are not saying, we don't believe that there is another way to be saved apart from Jesus. The Bible declares that there is no other way. Write it down. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There's no other way. You cannot believe in Jesus Christ and believe that there is also another way. He says, no. It's unacceptable. Now, any Christian who says he believes that there are other ways to God is confused. He's confused. The Holy Ghost is not working in his life. He's confused. The Bible declares it. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. And then Jesus, Jesus said, when you read St. John's Gospel 14 chapter, you read from the 6th verse. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he said, no man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way. You cannot believe in Jesus Christ and believe that there is another way. You cannot say that there are other ways and that Jesus is one of the many ways to God. When you believe that, you don't believe in Jesus. Jesus said, there's no other way. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. He made it clear. He didn't say, I'm, I'm a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So somebody says, but what about, that is what the Bible says. But other people also say, listen, listen. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Who else has been declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead? None other. Nobody else. Nobody else. Nobody else. The Word of God firmly declares that He was raised from the dead. And tells us that He is alive. There is no book in the world that declares any any, any religious leader to be alive after death. None. None. When they died, they were finished. See, Jesus died and he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So you see, we are not dealing with religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's not. You know, so you know, you can find people saying, I'm trying to decide which religion to join. Count Christianity out. It's not among them. It's not a religion. Praise God. Say this with me. I belong, I belong. to the kingdom of God. I function, I function in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. to establish, establish the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. Of Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That should be your vision. You should understand it as your calling. It is a divine responsibility. That's why 
We put in so much money to do it. That's why we put in so much effort to do it. That's why we give it so much time. Because we understand our responsibility. We belong in His kingdom. And the only way to truly belong there is to be born again. And God knows everybody that's born again. Hallelujah. And you know, when you're born again, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says that you are a citizen. You are a citizen. A citizen of heaven. Hallelujah. You're a citizen of heaven. You're not going to be, you are. See? And when you read in, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, let's go in there, beginning from the 22nd verse. Book of Hebrews, 12th chapter. From the 22nd verse, this, but he hath come unto Mount Zion. Notice it didn't say, ye shall come. He says, ye are come. That means you have arrived. When did you arrive? When you were born again. Praise God. But ye have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, hallelujah, and church of the firstborn, which are registered in heaven. <laughs> so we are registered. Glory to God. When you're born again, you're registered in heaven. You ought to know your name is there. You ought to know you're registered. Let me show you. This is beautiful. I like it. See, do you know something? Here, he is not talking about the, the book of life. Are you hearing me? There is a registration. <laughs> Oh, glory to God. There's a registration. Thank you, Lord. Because you're a citizen. Citizen. See, something about the kingdom of God that's important for you to understand is this. It is a spiritual kingdom. And it controls the moral and spiritual life of its members. Are you hearing this? It controls the moral and spiritual life of its members. Wow. Now, the kingdom of God is spiritual. If you would turn to um, the book of Romans, 14th chapter. 14th chapter. And um, go to the 17th verse. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Have you seen that? He says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Hmm. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, let me just quickly clear something for you because there's some of you, there's something, there's some things you've never heard me say and um, that's why I told you to be in this meeting. Because I said, there's some things we we share in meetings like this that we only share once in about 10 years. We can't talk about them every day. We can't, not even every week or every month. We only discuss them maybe once in about 10 years. Now, you know, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ, we will all be called to face him one by one. And at that judgment seat of Christ, you are to be rewarded for your works. So everyone who is listed is called at the judgment seat of Christ. That's a different register. It's not the same register 
that you have that's called the book of life. Now what about Old Testament folks? Oh yes, they will be called too. There's a register. Malachi speaks of the register. So, they're going to be called. But this register doesn't deal with whether or not you are supposed to be in the kingdom. As the name is called, you come and say, you tell before all the saints what you did for the kingdom of God. And before you speak, your whole life will be shown before everybody. And everyone can see your life on a screen. The Bible says, if you've done wrong, you suffer loss. For example, when someone is shown what he's supposed to get, his calling will be shown. God's purpose for his life will be shown. His rewards will be shown. Then, as it plays out, everything that was not of God in his life, particularly in his motives for what he did, as they come up, the rewards will be going down. If he was supposed to have ten cities, <laughs> he'll go to seven. <laughs> and then, there's another thing there, where he was supposed to do something, he didn't do it. And that was supposed to aim him another city, it goes down to six. Then there's another thing there. He was supposed to act and get another reward, he didn't do it, <laughs> it goes down to four. And then it goes down to three, two, and one. And uh, the final count, he doesn't even get a city. The Bible talks about this. As you're called one by one, everybody will be called. Everyone will be called. Everyone will be called. And when you're called, everybody else will be there listening and watching. You say, ah, by the time they get to my turn, forget it. It's not a day. Do you understand? It, it's just day. You, you understand what I'm talking about? There's not going to be a night. So it's going to be timeless. And we'll all be there. And everybody will just know you. <laughs> you can't come and we will just know you. We'll just know you. Didn't you see that, that Peter, James, and John immediately recognized Elijah and Moses and they didn't live in the same generation? There was no introduction. Moses and Elijah appeared and the disciples just recognized them. Peter spoke up and said, Master, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't have any introduction. So we're just going to know our heirs. Just call you by your first name. So as they call you, you stand there. We all know you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God forevermore. So he says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Oh, what life should we live? The Bible says, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be? I know you, many of you live far away. And I will have to round off tonight. In your life, make up your mind to be relevant to the kingdom of God. Become relevant. Anything you're asked to do in the house of God, let me tell you, be wise and do it with everything in you. Why? God will not call you on the last day about something they told you to do in the political arena in the world. God will not call you and ask you about anything that had to do with your estate. He will not call you about any of those things. Is going to call you in connection with the kingdom of God. That's what it's going to do. The Bible shows us. He's going to call you in connection with the kingdom of God. Whatever else you did in this life, it is how that thing was connected to the kingdom of God. That is going to ask you. 
You know, we tell people, win your family to Christ. They think it's a joke. Win your family to Christ. Because God's not going to be asking you how you took care of your family, about anything else. He will say, how were you a witness of the kingdom to your family? How? Now notice his connection, or his, his connection and construction when you study in the, in the first epistle of uh, Timothy, the fifth chapter, where he talks about that uh, 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 we should take care of our families. He said something. He said the man who will not take care of his family is worse than an infidel. Look at the connection. He says he's worse than a, non, a non-believer. An infidel. What does a believer do? And what does a non-believer do? A believer has a weakness. A non-believer disputes it. So he's telling you that when you take care of your family, you are a witness of the kingdom. You are bearing good witness of the kingdom. And that if you don't do it, you are worse than somebody who's against the kingdom. So you see the connection. If God has given you abilities for a business or a good job, you got a good employment, whatever it is, the question that God has on his mind is how did that benefit the kingdom of God? How? You have to understand the passion of God for the kingdom. That's what matters. What do you want to do in this life that has not been done before? What do you want to do? See? So make up your mind. Become, see, just make up your mind. Be decisive. Make up your mind. It's one way. You become passionate about Jesus and his kingdom. Understand your personal responsibility. But well, the Bible says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He says every one of us will. Every one of us will. Then it says to receive the things done in the body, whether it be good or evil. So you'd receive. At the end it says then shall every man have praise of God. So, some are going to be praised more than others. Would you like to be praised for getting there? No, think about it. The only praise some people will get is, Welcome, it's good you made it. You know, like some people, maybe you say, Oh, you're coming from afar. What did you come with? I came with myself. You came with yourself. Hallelujah. So God's going to be asking you, what did you come with? What did you arrive heaven with? He wants to see how you influence many other lives. There are going to be lots and lots of people, like some of you who are responsible for absolute realities, to other cities, other countries, some people you will never meet in this world. But you've been responsible for getting the material across to them. And God, when He calls that up, your points go up. But if God laid it in your heart and He said, buy a hundred copies, and you say, <laughs> that must be the devil. <laughs> On that day, you'll be amazed. Everybody will be there. Everybody will hear how God spoke it. Son, buy a hundred copies of Rhapsody for free distribution. Everybody will hear it when God spoke to you. Listen, Jesus said the things that he said to you in secret will be shouted on house stops. In other words, everybody's going to hear. So then, we hear it as we're all sitting or standing actually before him. We hear his voice to you, son, 100 copies of Rhapsody. Then we hear your reply. That must be the devil. <laughs> then you see... From whatever reward it was going to be, it just goes down. Son, send 25,000 to your mother. She's praying and asking God 
for a miracle. Send her 25,000 now. You say, can't do that. Then we look. Uh-huh. Then you say, but I, I didn't know it was God. I, I didn't know. And then the voice will answer you. Did the devil ever do good? Hallelujah. The Bible tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind was he? The Bible tells us that he despised the shame of the cross. Why? Because of the glory that was to follow. I always remember, brother, there are several others who have done about the same thing. We were preparing for a program at the stadium. And he said to himself, what will I give? He had just been paid some money which he wanted to use to furnish his house. You know what he did? He decided not to furnish his house. And gave that money for the program at the stadium. I heard it from the one who went to visit him. The God there said, no furniture. He said, no. Huh? After all the promotion you got? Because he was promoted at work. He said, ah, no. Don't worry about that. And when he pressed him further, no, you have to. He said, no. I wanted to make sure we finished the program at the station. And he gave that money. Let me tell you. In the churches, it is not those people that park the biggest cars that probably give the most money. When people wonder about all the money that's given in the ministry, it's those whose hearts are sold out to God. Did you know that when we were preparing for a certain program, a brother moved out of his duplex. Hello? A brother moved out of his duplex into a flat. So he could get the money off it and give it. Meanwhile, you have another one crying, Oh God, move me into a duplex. Oh God, move me into a duplex. Someone moved out of the duplex into a flat so that souls could be saved. If you are playing about the gospel, don't think everybody is playing like you. I'm telling you. Don't think everybody else is playing like you. Some are very serious. So why are you planning for your next most expensive shoes? How much for those shoes? 150,000. You are excited. It is okay. Go and compete with your mates. That's what you're trying to do. The question is, what have you done for the kingdom? That day, all of us will see your Maori shoes. And how it was only 20,000 you give to God. Let me tell you. Before ever, you let yourself go living on expensive things, make sure that you have given much more than that in the kingdom of God. Live on the extras. Make the kingdom of God your major responsibility. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It is too important. It is too important. That's what we do. So when you see us like this, it is, it is the extra, the leftover that you're actually seeing. God blesses us with a lot of money. But that's the reason we also bless the work of the ministry. Are you still there? Maybe when you come tomorrow, we will talk more. Say thank you Lord Jesus. Lift your hands toward heaven.